we can leap into some questions with Kathy since we're here. I come from a non-traditional background where I didn't go to university. However, I do have a lot of friends who attended different universities and I've heard a lot of them express a lot of frustration with like how outdated they say the curriculum is and how they're not learning anything useful and blah, blah, blah. And I wonder, do you think that your data centric intro to computing curriculum and focusing on the data could be a tool to soothe these frustrations? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly what we seem to be seeing. The course that I've put together around this is extremely popular from students across campus. The students that, that I work with, they know that data is playing a huge role in their lives, whether it's their academic lives or their personal lives. Like they're on social media, they're concerned about algorithmic bias and Facebook and all of these issues. So by teaching this course centered through data, we bring those issues up. When we're looking at the tables, we talk about metadata and privacy. We talk about how does inference get made from a, from a large data set. So I think we are able to connect these to the kinds of concerns that students have both academically and personally. And I think that that takes a lot of that stale feeling out of the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess the follow-up question to that is also, I really like the slide where you said, you know, you don't, you don't pick a language and, and teach to it. Um, I think the question needs to also be asked that, is it necessarily the responsibility of a university to teach these like constantly evolving frameworks and languages and ecosystems so that a student leaves the university, you know, with the bachelor's prepared to start the workforce? Or is that something that should be done in an internship or should be done on their off time or? Um... So, you know, when I look at the, the typical student population, not all of my students are headed the same place. So if I want to teach the language that appears everybody for the workforce, what the heck do I teach them? Right? I've got students going into everything from, you know, building uh, low level systems to doing data analysis, to doing graphics and animation. I, you can't center an intro curriculum around the needs of industry because your students aren't all going to the same place. Now, maybe if you're in a boot camp and you're trying to prepare students for a very specific injury, I'm sorry, industry, that calculus is different. But at the university level, there is no one place they're all trying to go. And I also think that we need to get students to have a flexibility to adapt to different languages. I'm a strong believer in having students use multiple languages in the first semester or first year so that they begin to appreciate what it takes to take something they've learned in one language and move it to another language. And then I think industry and internships, those are places where you start to learn the conventions of the subfield and the work you're trying to go into. The other thing we tell students when they come in as first years is that, you know, the average hype cycle of a language is about seven years. So if I teach them now what's in the hype cycle, within a year or two of them graduating, it's going to be dead anyway. So I'm not serving them well by, by teaching to the hype cycle. Right, right. The fundamentals are really what's important there. Right. So I see we have, has Dragon joined us now? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello, Dragon. Okay. All right. So we have all the talkers in the panel. I have heard that there is a raised hand. Uh, oh, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question then, Ethan? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's for Kathy. Uh, I really love the talk. Um, I was just having a conversation with Elena uh, Makasova. I can't pronounce her name very well. But she's at University of Minnesota mm -hmm. and also interested in teaching um, functional languages. And I, I did a computer science minor when I was like in college, like 20 years ago, uh -huh. and it was all object oriented. Right. And it's just, and then I've gotten into functional. It's just amazing to, to kind of like realize how different that would look now. Um, mm -hmm. This was really illuminating, kind of like helped me understand what the road I've traveled. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess there, I had so many questions, but I think maybe one that most 
Yeah, it is, is um, you mentioned that data engineering gets overlooked. And I've always, I've kind of like, I've noticed that too. And I always wondered why, because as somebody who programs like regular programming, you know, kind of like full stack or whatever, one of the things I like about it is there's this kind of like carpentry aspect of like designing a system. And when I think about data science, which also interests me a great deal, sometimes it's like that path of like design, you know, training a model seems kind of repetitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I miss the carpentry aspect. And I kind of wonder if I've always wondered, it seemed to me like data engineering might be a place where that exists more. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wondered why it doesn't get more attention. I wonder if you have like more, more to say about what, why that is, or, so, you know, yeah. You know, the same way you have legacy languages survive in software projects, you have legacy curricular designs serve in university departments, right? There are conventional ways that we have taught programming for a long time. And you have to, at some point, you have to decide that it's time to throw out the way you've been doing it and, and revamp what you're doing. So a lot of places I think are still stuck in the 70s, frankly, that basic C programming, maybe we do basic C programming in Python syntax, but we haven't fundamentally changed the way we think about the topic sequence. And data engineering doesn't really align with a topic sequence that says, first we teach variables, then we teach while loops. It just, they don't line up right. So you have to come at curricular design by asking yourself, what do I want my students to learn how to do? What do I think is feasible for them to learn given what they know already? And then kind of break it down and construct it back up from there. But if your curriculum is kind of in an older way of looking at the world or older set of those decisions, you have to make a conscious decision to break that. So I think we saw that jump happen once in the early 90s when people started jumping to say, let's do objects now. And things changed around to what they were doing. Yeah. Um, you know, now you're getting, you get some jumps around scripting. There's kind of been the scripting jump that's happened. And now I think we're getting ready for a data science jump. Um, yeah, it's just, it's the nature of the, the beast. Just maybe a quick follow for that. Is part of your argument that the fun, that maybe the, the functional mode of teaching is particularly useful for that last jump? I'm that arguing that, so given, if you look at a data science library, it's very heavily functional, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's higher order functions, basically. They don't might have the same syntax, but it's, that's the concept of what we're doing. So the functional style of thinking about code aligns very naturally with many data science libraries, yeah. right? And that's the perspective from which I'm saying, I think functional is a good platform from which to launch this. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you for responding to that. Um, so going to loop Dragon back in here, I know you think you got lucky and we were going to forget about you, but we're not. Um, start with the ice icebreaker question that I am particularly interested in. I would love to hear about your interest in Cuban salsa dancing and how you got into that. And also whether you've talked with Chris Nuremberger about his passion for dancing, because I know y'all are, I know y'all know each other in the same spaces. So uh, yeah, let's break the ice with you. Oh, so I got into salsa maybe 12 years ago or something like that. And it was, um, well, uh, in Belgrade, uh, Serbia, there are lots of uh, Cubans because they don't they don't need visa, so they use it as a kind of a jumping uh, point uh, for uh, uh, emigrating to Europe. Uh, so there are lots of them, and they introduced salsa maybe twenty years ago into the city, and it got uh, relatively popular. Uh, so there are lots of uh, schools, lots of parties, and um, that's how I got into it. Uh, and I, I didn't know Chris uh, also dances. So that's another great thing <laughs> about him. Yeah. Do you think it relates to um, that style of dancing? Do you think it relates to um, the way you think about programming or is it just completely different? Well, perhaps <laughs> it's, it's, um, 
it's uh, let's say it's pretty improvisational style of dancing, like a street style. Uh, it's not competitive. It's a social dance. So it's important to enjoy yourself and uh, with your partners and friends and just have a great time not to compete with each other. So maybe there are similar things in programming because the point in programming is not that there are winners, uh, winners and losers. The point is that at least in open source uh, programming, the point is that we all help each other and uh, learn from each other and uh, uh, work together. Uh, yeah, so the community aspect sounds like it's uh, what draws you to that and also what draws you to open source work. That That's that's really wonderful. Um, okay, since we're doing round robin style, we can go back to Kathy now, um, kind of do a follow-up question about what we were just speaking about with Ethan. And uh, what do you think of the recent boom of data science as a chosen major and a career path? And do you think that that is sustainable or do you think it's just hot right now and it'll eventually settle down? Do you think it's just going to keep going up? Um, I hear the market's very competitive and it's very, uh, very trendy, that space. It's certainly trendy. Um, but I think there's a, there is a fundamental grain of truth there that we are collecting volumes of data and many industries and disciplines are making decisions based on data. So if data is gonna be a fundamental bit of organizational infrastructure, then people need to know how to work with it. Um, so I don't think the need to have students prepared to work with data is going away. I think what might go away is the feeling that this is the thing that you major in because you wanna make sure you get a job. Right, you know, like people don't run around getting degrees in English because they need literacy. Right, at some point, it becomes a literacy that we figured out how to get to everybody, and it doesn't have kind of the the trendiness that it that it has now. But I think there's something healthy to the trendiness um, when it's bursty like this because it really forces us on the education side to stop and ask: Am I serving? people well with this. You know, I've been teaching for 25 years. When I started, you majored in computer science because you were going to be a computer scientist. You didn't have people who kind of picked up a little computer science in an intro class because they thought they should have it as a job skill. So you could teach your intro classes, assuming that the people who were, were, should be in there were the people who were going to go all the way to a major. And if you lost out the people who weren't going to major, that was okay because that wasn't who the course was for. Now we have been forced to reckon with the idea that our intro courses have to serve the entire campus. People who will take one course and stop and still wanna do something useful with it. That's a paradigm shift in how you think about teaching your courses. So I think there's a real value to these trendy spikes if they force us to rethink the population we're trying to serve with our classes rather than just try to figure out how to get everybody through an intro programming class and see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And increasing literacy when it comes to data and when it comes to computer science is, is super important. And that can kind of uh, take us into our next question for Dragon here. And uh, I'll take this time to do a quick shout out to Jacob, who has been so forthright with questions in the chats. You've been a great role model. Thank you so much. As hosts and organizers, we really appreciate you putting in these questions that everyone's wondering. So Jacob says to Dragon that if I want to learn to use machine learning for my work problems, but I don't know anything about machine learning or data science, what learning path can I take? And I assume if you wanna consume your content Dragon, if there are particular books to start with, what to pre-study, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a really a great, a great question because probably every develop, developer, not only Clojure programmer, but any Java programmer or any C sharp programmer or even any Python programmer would ask themselves, okay, I see that machine learning is somewhat popular. I see that lots of people are talking about it. I see that lots of uh, Big companies are pushing some 
uh, impressive applications that they say use machine learning for. So I want to know more about it and probably to upgrade my skills and someday use it uh, in, in solving practical problems. But what is usually the problem for us developers? Then we go, okay, let me, let me see what are the most popular books or mo most popular courses that deal with machine learning. And uh, there are two kinds of. One kind is directed primarily to, towards researchers in machine learning and data science. So people who probably uh, have a lots of math background, lots of st statistics background. Uh, so that content is heavily based on theory and has almost no applications and no code. The other uh, big uh, big chunk of uh, the the content that is available is uh, written from people and uh, for people who uh, maybe don't have much background in maths, don't have much backgrounds in uh, computer programming, but have a background in some scientific field or some or some uh, specific field uh, that. Uh, machine learning is applied for. For example, uh, statisticians uh, or uh, biology uh, majors, or maybe business uh, people or something like that. So they uh, that content is uh, heavily directed towards applications of a black box. So uh, machine learning and, and data science without proper understanding but just put into context with some receipt, uh, recipes how to solve these particular kinds of uh, business problems or, or scientific problems with machine learning. So developers are neither of these typical archetypes. So we have problems. The theoretical, uh, theoretical literature is too abstract for us. We don't see how to apply it easily without majoring in maths and statistics. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the business side is too superficial for us because we immediately see how to apply it and maybe understand how it works on surface, but we still don't understand how exactly this works and how we would apply for different problems. So uh, my approach was to offer something that is uh, targeted for developers. So takes developers perspective, uh, assumes that a developer has some background in maths a long time ago, everything is forgotten. We have this something like, like a skill that is underneath, but we don't really have it, it's, it's a bit rusty. Uh, so we need a refresher for that. We may know some basic statistics, but usually we didn't understand it properly, even when we uh, attended these courses, and let alone five or 10 years after that. Uh, and we need something that is uh, that we can run off on our computers immediately and see how each part develops. So my point is, when we build something, we start to understand that that's the way uh, that we think about problems. When we when we program something, for example, we don't we may not understand accounting, but when we program uh, an accounting system, as a part of that, we we start to understand something about accounting. We we may not be experts, but we know a lot of it. Or uh, about, for example. Uh, inventory uh, management. When we program such system, we start to understand how this being business functions. So uh, the point is that I try to do something uh, like that for machine learning, uh, specifically deep learning, and for linear algebra and the math background uh, uh, that is needed for, for all kinds of uh, machine learning that is based on linear algebra. Yeah. Oh, thanks. so so to, to come to, to oh to yeah yeah. What about what book? What path? How do we? Let me. Is there something about the uh, Cyclos group? Maybe I don't know. 
Uh, yes. Uh, so, so now, now the actual answer. Uh, the answer is uh, regarding my books. Um, they are uh, both books are uh, self uh, uh, are can be used independently of each other. So uh, the deep learning book is uh, a primer of how to build a deep learning library from scratch and apply it to some typical problems that are used for teaching deep learning and how to integrate with uh, Intel's and NVIDIA's uh, mainstream uh, high performance uh, tensor libraries. So uh, we start assuming that you don't know much and it, in each chapter, we learn one or two things and we build these things and that's how we build understanding. Uh, so uh, most programmers could follow it without referencing the numeric, numerical linear algebra book. But at some point, uh, most programmers will be a bit more com uh, confused with the details because they forgot about linear algebra and math. So at these points, they could uh, go to numerical linear algebra book and uh, learn uh, these specific things. So deep learning is more like a novel and numerical linear algebra is more, more like a collection of uh, short stories that build on each other. Uh, and this is uh, more uh, concentrated on the actual core of machine learning and, and deep learning and linear algebra, uh, not, with, uh, uh, not with so much with the other uh, aspects that uh, cycloge libraries or other integration libraries are concerned, which is more like, okay, how do I consume CVS files and web services and different databases? And uh, how do I do this uh, data, gluing the different kinds of data sources? Uh, my books deal with, okay, uh, we have a data source and how do we get it into closure and how do we build a system that can uh, learn these functions from data because mm -hmm. deep learning is basically neural networks are basically function approximators. And can people uh, contact you on the Zulip or email you for if they would like to know more, I assume? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, okay. there are, I'm active on most of uh, closure communities. So awesome. they can contact me. Awesome. All right. We are going to do one last question to Kathy here and then end it off so we can have a five minute break before our keynote. So Kathy, do you think that programming is a life skill? Should this person be teaching their wife and their kids to code? Or do you think it is more of an expertise that, that you know, if you the literacy shouldn't need to be considered if um, you're not going to specialize in that domain professionally. Yeah, so I think through this question, because I've, I've been on several organizations um, in, in different states in the United States that are developing their learning standards in computing for K-12. So that's kind of the frame from which I think about this. I don't think everybody needs to know how to program. I think everybody needs to, how to live safely in a digital society where data is collected about them and shared about them all the time. You need to understand the life cycle of data. You need to understand what people do with information, what people can do with phones all the time, right? It's, so I think that's actually the life skill is living in a digital world. Programming is a medium that works for many people to learn that skill and to express that skill. But I don't think programming is necessarily the end skill, especially if you look at the small amount of programming that one could fit in, say to a, you know, an elementary school curriculum, you wouldn't get to do enough of it to turn it into a life skill. So I'd rather see us thinking about just literacy of data and citizenry, as it were. And if programming becomes part of that because your school district can fit it in, that's great. Um, but otherwise, you know, being able to move sprites around the screen, which is where a lot of students get, it might feel powerful, which is itself a, a good thing. But I don't think that's the 
life skill. Yeah, yeah, I do. I agree that there is a difference between um, computer literacy and programming literacy. You know, you should know how to navigate a file using a GUI, but maybe not need to open the terminal for everything. Right. So, um, right. Right. so with that, um, that was Dragon and Kathy. We are going to take a quick five minute break so everybody can use the bathroom, stretch your legs, grab coffee, do anything you need to do before our very, very, very exciting keynote speaker. And I'd love to hear more questions from y'all because we, we need some questions for Mr. Wolfram. Okay. See you soon.